Hello there and welcome to The Meaningful Stitch. This is episode 25 and I am Amy Palco and I'm coming to you from Edinburgh, Scotland. And this is my digital home from home, a place where I get to share with you my knitting practice and my knitting projects. Now it's been a bit about four weeks, I think, since uh, this last uh, the last episode went out. So that's been a wee while. So I've got lots and lots of knitting to share with you this time round. Got a big pile of finished objects sitting beside me. So we'll take a run through those, and you might notice another finished object here. <laughs> but before we get into all of that, I have drawn a card for us today from I chose it from. The Heart of Fairy Oracle, which is a beautiful deck by Brian and Wendy Froud. And the card I chose for us today is quite a funny one, so I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. <laughs> it's this one here. It's the fixer. Look at this little guy's face. <laughs> so the words from the guide are the fixer. Bubo the fixer has been fixing things since the time of the great plagues in Europe. In Venice, he whitewashed over everything in sight, hoping to keep the plague at bay. Walls, floors, tables, chairs, windows, everything. Sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't, but he never stopped doing his job. He is just as busy today, constantly whitewashing things that he thinks would be best left unseen. He believes that mistakes should be covered up, broken things swept under the carpet or hastily thrown away. Lies told to smooth over rifts in relationships. He does this with the best of intentions. He just wants to make everything right again. Do you find yourself constantly trying to make things better by covering them up instead of addressing them? Would you like nothing better than a bucket of whitewash to paint over everything that appears to be going wrong? That's what Bubo does. But whitewash has an annoying way of flaking off and revealing what is underneath. Things that are covered up also have an alarming way of surfacing at inconvenient times. Lies, once told, grow and multiply until no amount of whitewash will cover them. When Bubo appears, think about how you handle situations that need attention and try doing more than just covering them up. Facing things can be scary, but sometimes a lick of paint just won't do. So there we go. There's Bubo, the fixer. <laughs> And I think that's rather appropriate because I have made some mistakes in the last four weeks in my knitting in particular. Um, and I'm, go I'm going to be sharing all those with you because, you know, sometimes our knitting does go wrong. And that's OK, because the wonderful thing about knitting is that we can always rip it out and start again. Unless it is, of course, steaked, in which case we will have cut our knitting and <laughs> then we might just have to start again. And I have actually started again with something, but not something that was steaked. So I'm going to be sharing all of that with you. And I also am going to be adding in a new section in the running order of things here. And that is called mending because I've got some mending to share with you also. So like I said, lots and lots to move through. I am sitting in the back room of my, um, of my flat and you might be able to see that we have a little bit of lighting issues going on because the sun is about to stream in through this window and I'm hoping to be able to get through this episode without having to adjust my position in the room or change rooms altogether. But we, but we will see. This might be a tale of two parts, <laughs> but uh, fingers crossed. So starting with what I'm wearing. Well, what I'm wearing is a finished object. And it's a finished object that you will not have seen before because I hadn't cast it on four weeks ago. So it was a, I found it to be a very quick knit. It is the Spark Cardigan by Andrea Mowry. So I have knitted this in Drops Lima, which is a wool alpaca blend. I think it's 60%, 40%. Um, and it's a dark blue. Now it's not really showing up very properly in this current lighting situation that we have. Maybe if I come forward slightly, you'll be, oh, there we go. You might be able to see that a bit better. So there's a beautiful blue. We've got this um, very broad um, garter stitch shawl collar here, which is wonderful because it comes up and it keeps my neck really cozy. And then we have this wonderful color work 
Now this is one by one colour work so it knits up really easily and at the bottom of the sleeves and of the body of the cardigan we have these flames. Now you'll see that my sleeves are not exactly symmetrical <laughs> and this is because the yarn that I'm using for the colour work is by a company called Krempke Soul Wool and this particular base is called In The Mood Surprise and it's in the colour Cheerfulness and it was a lovely gift from my mum who I think picked it up from My Little Mai which is the local yarn shop in Cognac, France which is the closest uh, yarn shop to my mum. So uh, Stephanie there um, has a beautiful selection of yarn so if you are in the area or passing through then it is well worth popping in have a wee look. Uh, she stocks a variety of different yarns, uh, including some Cowgirl Blues and some Tola Matin, so it's always worth that. I think she also stocks Mon Sheep Shop as well, but that might not be that might not be right. And she also has some wonderful mohairs, which um, from Mohair de Ferme de France, which is just it glows it glows on the shelf it's amazing and a beautiful range of colors so like i said if you are if you are in the area you might want to go and check out my little my in cognac france but that's where this yarn came from i'm pretty sure and uh, if not i've just given her just given her a plug <laughs> but uh, this yarn is quite similar to the um the spin cycle yarn in that it's it graduates through different colors so you have two strands and the two strands are different colors and they are both graduating through uh, a spectrum so when you're knitting with it it's always a joy because you're seeing the the color shift and change and it really kind of gets shown off to wonderful effect in this one by one color work in particular but of course, what that does mean is that we don't end up with things that are entirely symmetrical. So I tried to start off my yarn with sections that were both quite, quite similar. You'll see they're both sort of yellowy, greeny brown, but then they kind of diverge a little bit. This one's got a lot more blue in it and this one's got a lot more brown in it. But, uh, and I'll stand up so you can see the, you can see the body here. You'll see it's a belted cardigan with the longest belt in history. I will talk more about that in a second. But you can see here as well how the colour is graduating up through the body. This base is an incredibly soft, fine merino. And so it has started to, to fuzz a little bit. You can see I've been wearing this a lot <laughs> because it's so cosy. Because the wonderful thing about stranded colour work, of course, is that you're essentially creating what is a double sided fabric. So if I open this up, you'll see that this colour, that these pops of colour are carried through the back as well. So you are always carrying two strands of yarn, which is creating a lovely thick and cosy fabric. Now I have had the yarn for this in my stash with the intention to knit this cardigan for quite some time. I think Andrea Mowry brought it out, gosh, maybe about 18 months ago, maybe maybe even longer. And um, as soon as I saw it, I loved it. Uh, I love a belted cardigan. I love a shawl collar. <laughs> I love a slightly longer length. I love folded cuffs. <laughs> and I love this color work. Um, and so when my mum gave me the creme key yarn, I knew it would be absolutely perfect for that. And I hopped onto Wool Warehouse, where, uh, which is where I buy my Drops yarn from. And I bought Drops Lima to go with it in this lovely kind of rich blue shade. I thought it would really help the, the browns and the golds and the greens and the oranges to really, to really pop. Uh, but like I said, it's been sitting in my stash for quite some time. But it was just in January that I decided that what I really needed was some cheerfulness in my life, which of course is this, the name of this wonderful, the wonderful yarn. And so I cast it on and it went super, super fast. But the thing that had kind of prevented me from casting it on before that was the fact that this is a steaked cardigan. Now, 
I've mentioned sticking on this um, on this channel before and um, and my concerns around it in the fact that it reduces the reusability of yarn. I think that is one of the great gifts of yarn and of wool that we can we can always take it back and knit it back up into a different form. And so for that reason, I think it's an incredibly sustainable uh, fiber and, and um, material to, to use. But once we cut it, of course, it becomes significantly less so. So uh, I, have some, I have some concerns around that. However, I have steaked on a few occasions. You'll remember I steaked and I mentioned steaking in the last episode because I knitted the Vare by Gudrun Johnson and that included steaking for armholes and the neck band, which is, or for the neck shaping. And that's the first time that I had steaked for that purpose. The other time that I have steaked was for my Stone Crop Cardi by Andrea Mowry, and that was a straight steak up the middle. Both of those projects used sticky yarn. And by sticky yarn, I mean rustic woolly yarn that is, um, that that has a, a bit of um, a bit of tooth to it. It's not super wash, so it's not that's that um, it doesn't have that coating on it, and so it kind of sticks to itself. So it doesn't tend to unravel very easily. If you drop a stitch, it tends to stay exactly where it is, <laughs> which is very handy. It doesn't slip down through through the fabric, and uh, and with sticking, of course, because you're cutting it up the center it's not going to unravel back in the other direction so uh, so you, you feel on relatively surer ground with uh, with that kind of yarn when you are sticking however this yarn is the very opposite <laughs> this was the first time that I had ever steaked something which was not a non superwash and, and so for that reason, I was very nervous. I was concerned that doing a crochet uh, reinforcement like the kind that I demonstrated with the Veer last episode and which I also used for the stone crop was not necessarily going to work with this this time. And so I determined that I was going to have to do the machine reinforcement, which means getting my sewing machine out my grandma gave me my sewing machine on my 21st birthday. That was a while ago. <laughs> Since then, my daughter's probably used it. I'm going to grab my cup of tea. Since then, my daughter's probably used it more than I have. And I, I do take it out on occasion to use it for some things. I do always have great intentions because I would love to you know, get more into dressmaking and start to make some clothes for myself and really transition not just into a hand knitted wardrobe but into a handmade, hand sewn wardrobe. Not hand sewn, machine sewn, but you know what I mean. <laughs> so, um, so yes, I had to get my machine out. Now, my daughter had actually used my machine just before Christmas because she wanted to make a beautiful case for her partner for their Nintendo Switch. And uh, she did an incredibly beautiful job because my daughter is an exquisite sewer. If you are not familiar with her, she is a kilt maker and she's the kilt maker behind the company Northern Lights Kilts. And I interviewed her about her kilt making and about her kilt making journey. Uh, gosh, a few episodes ago now, but I will share that uh, link to that episode in the show notes. Oh, and I should say about show notes, there will be a link in the description bar below that will take you to a page that will give you all the show notes, all the images, all the links to everything that I'm speaking about. It's hosted on my Patreon, but it's free for everybody to access. So yes, Aurora, my daughter, had used my machine just before Christmas and she had said the yarn, the yarn, the thread is snapping and uh, and it was quite, uh, it was quite, it had quite a tight tension on it and she recommended that I get it serviced and I said yes yes and then did not get it serviced. <laughs> 
and uh, now I had to use it myself and discovered that yes, absolutely, the, the um, tension was too great and the yarn is snapping. So, however, <laughs> I persisted and I did manage, I'll open it up so you can see, I did manage to get a row of sewn reinforcement added to the garment. Now, I'm not sure if you're going to see, be able to see this. Um, because it's all kind of, oh there we go, there's a good place. So you'll see that I ran a white thread so I could see what, so I could see where, oh dear, I'm blowing out terribly, but so I could see exactly where I was going with it. And I ran that up the entire length um, before cutting it. And you'll see that it has stayed intact, thank heavens. Now the yarn, the thread, keep saying yarn, the thread, <laughs> the thread did snap several times and so it meant going back over and starting from further back and, and going back over the, um, the area. But I did finally make it up and through and now I have a couple of suggestions for places in Edinburgh to get my machine serviced and I will get that done this year because it, it really does need to be done and if I do want to keep it as a serviceable uh, tool, then then that's really uh, a necessity. So I'll be getting that done now. Now, now that I've, I've struggled with it myself, uh, I, will, I will go ahead and sort that out. After sticking, you then pick up your stitches all the way along here, all the way up and round, and start on your shawl collar, which is then created through a multitude of, you see, through a multitude of short rows so uh, and then and then knitting straight to create this this band here and then after you've done all of that you're still not finished <laughs> because you have the world's longest knitted belt to do I think it said from memory I think it's 74 inches it's 1.88 meters of belt that you've to do and it's a double knitted belt. So you'll see that we've got two sides to the fabric here. And that's done through knitting and slipping your stitches. Now, I had good fun with this project as a whole because one of the things I decided to do was to take little video snapshots just to kind of show where I was at in my current work of progress and I shared them to Instagram. So if you want to see how I do one by one rib, if you want to see how I have picked up these stitches or if you want to see how I did the double knitting on the belt, then you can, you can go and check out my Instagram. Again, there'll be a link to that in my show notes and you'll be able to see exactly what my, what my process is for that. It was, in this instance, I um, did kind of like a continental style uh, knitting stitch because you are knitting one stitch and then bringing your yarn forward and slipping the next stitch and then bringing your yarn to the back to knit the next. If you are doing that with your right hand, it means that you're constantly having to bring the yarn forward and back and forward and back. And the same with doing um, same with doing brioche or something like that. Um, you're always have with your brioche knit stitches. You're always having to bring your yarn forward, and this kind of um, action with your finger actually creates pain in your wrist, which then creates issues with your forearm. <laughs> so um, it's amazing that this kind of action here can create issues up here, but it absolutely can. And so, um, so what I tend to do when I have these kinds of um, parts of a knitting project to do, where it's going to involve bringing my yarn back and forth a lot, I tend to then switch and I do continental for that. So I do continental brioche knit stitches and I do, um, knit, I do English style or throwing style um, for my brioche pearls. Uh, with the double knitting, I did continental because it was just so much easier to bring the yarn forward and back. Um, and it was a much smaller action and it didn't set up any any kind of pain or inflammation. Uh, so, so yeah, I think one of the important things when you are a prolific knitter 
is that you find the best knitting style for you and that you choose something which is appropriate and pain, as pain free as possible. I think there are a variety of different resources if you are experiencing knitting pain. I think there's a whole book about it and I know that Fruity Knitting, the wonderful podcast um, that I'm sure you're all very familiar with, has a whole episode about knitting pain uh, where she interviews, uh, I think it's a, a physiotherapist who specialises in, in the kind of pain that knitters get. So. So yeah, that's all really worth checking out if this is uh, if this is an issue for you. But one of the things I do recommend that if you are um, discovering that you are getting some some pain in knitting, there are some basic um, exercises that you can do, basic stretches. I am not an expert, by it, so I'm not going to show you anything <laughs> because uh, you know I think you should go and check out people who know what they're talking about here. <laughs> But, uh, but the other thing that I have done that's really helped is, is switching up my knitting style. So whether that's moving from my regular throwing to continental. The reason why I don't switch wholly over onto continental is because I actually really love the way that I knit uh, with the throwing style. It's, uh, I find it very soothing. It's the way that I was taught by my grandma. It's the way that she was taught by her grandma. So it feels as though that part of my knitting has a strong connection to my lineage and that feels very important to me to hold on to. But the other thing, when, you know, moving away from the, from the, I suppose the more um, uh, soul content of knitting to the more practical side of knitting would be um, that I feel as though I get much, much better tension when I knit by throwing than picking. When I pick my knit, my knits, I tend to end up with a much larger stitch. Um, so you can easily see if you can if you can see when I switch between throwing my knits and picking my knits, um, because the the tension alters so dramatically within the fabric, and I I don't really like that. So I do think I get a much better tension through through throwing, which is not surprising because. I've been knitting in that style since before I can remember. So this is the <laughs> this is the absolute default for me and I tension my yarn by very not very tightly at all, but it is tensioned through through this the crook of my pinky. And it's a, it's, it's a very natural hold because of course I've done so much knitting. So yes, uh, so the the double knit belt was done with continental stitch and like I said if you want to see that being done or the one by one or the picking up the stitches you can see all of that on my Instagram channel. And then the, I should have said too, the collar is actually finished off with an I-cord so there's a lot of interesting little techniques to explore in this so if you if you would like to explore perhaps sticking <laughs> or one by one colour work. This is a really lovely way to explore colour work. Or if you want to learn um, your eye cord or um, short rows, there's a whole range of, um, of techniques to explore in this one garment. Uh, the other place eye cords show up is the belt loops, which are here. So you do four belt loops all together. You can see the length there because it kind of comes down to sort of just below my hip. So it's a super cozy cardigan. I love it. It's perfect for this time of year, particularly, you know, when it's getting a bit colder here in Edinburgh. We've had an exceptionally mild winter. But uh, last night, I think we got down into minus three degrees Celsius. And if you are from... Uh, America or uh, particularly the north of America or Canada you're probably laughing your heads off just now because that, that is not cold hey <laughs> not compared with what you're getting but it is cold with what uh, with what we've had and we've very rarely dipped into into negative figures this year and and that is I think pretty unusual for us but it has been mild but it is getting a little bit colder now and a cardigan is just so perfect to kind of throw on when we start to feel a little bit chilly and to snuggle up in. So really pleased with this. 
Um, I think I got it knitted up in about 10 days. So it's knitted in DK weight. So um, I'm always reminded that um, DK weight knits up very quickly. And actually I don't generally knit in DK or heavier weight yarns. I like, um, I really like knitting in four ply or at the most sport, really sport weight. But that said, <laughs> Most of the projects I've got to share with you today, well, certainly another, yeah, this one and another two are knitted in these heavier weight yarns. So let's get on to another finished object. The next one, I think I had shown, well, I certainly spoken about my intentions to cast this one. I'm not sure whether I had already had, but these are the Snowshoe Socks by Emily Foden. They are in the Knits About Winter book that she brought out, which is published by Pom Pom. It's a beautiful book. There are lots of lovely designs in it. I have also knitted the Soiree sweater from that book in my Nutaden yarn. And I think I shared that probably, well, it must have been January, February last year, because that's roughly when I completed it. So if you want to go and check that out, you go back a year and you'll find it. <laughs> but these are the snowshoe socks. I have knitted these up in Drops Charisma. These are the leftovers of my of the knit that I did for my husband before Christmas, which was the Letho Wee. So that was by Natasha Hornby, Moonstruck Knits. And it's the it's the different uh, shaped version of the Letho, which I have also knitted for myself. So I knitted one for Frank and my husband and I used the leftovers to make these socks. Now you'll see that they're both different because I was just playing around with them basically. Uh, I, I'm, If you've watched this podcast before, you will know that I am not a great sock knitter by any stretch of the imagination. I can knit them. <laughs> I just don't particularly enjoy knitting them. However, I do seem to end up knitting them for other people more often than I end up knitting them for myself. But this is a, a three by one rib uh, after the cuff, and then it's a heel flap and gusset and kitchener toe. Don't look too closely at my kitchener because I'm appalling at kitchener stitch. I can do it again. It just always looks messy. <laughs> So these, there's not really a huge amount to say about these other than this is the socks. <laughs> when I looked at them, I thought, oh God, these are absolutely huge. And I thought they were too big. And then Frank put them on and they fitted perfectly. So it turns out it's just got very big feet. <laughs> there you go. Um, he absolutely loves these socks. He wears them as, um, as like slippers. These are like slipper socks and he wears them when he gets home from his work for an hour or so, keep his, keep his feet warm in the evenings. Um, so they are getting good wear, which always makes the effort worthwhile. But yes, these are the first socks that I have knitted as Magic Loop. Normally I would use DPNs, double pointed needles, um, or I have knitted socks using those flexi flips, and I didn't get on so well with those. And I have also knitted using the very small circular needles too, and I found them really fiddly also. So I figured, well, I've tried almost every other way of, <laughs> of knitting socks. Maybe if I try a uh, magic loop, then that will unlock sock knitting for me. It did not unlock so it's not snock. <laughs> sock knitting for me, but it did um, allow me to finish a pair of socks relatively quickly and painlessly. It didn't create any laddering, which was what I had been concerned about with, with Magic Loop. And since then, I would say I'm much more comfortable doing Magic Loop in general. So anyway, not really a huge amount to say about these other than they were requested they have been knitted, they are worn, <laughs> um, they are just a fun pair of cosy ribbed knits in a, I think Charisma is, Charisma's DK, so they're DK socks, 
but they're also knitted on a relatively um, loose gauge as well. So it, they did knit up. They did knit up quickly when I finally brought myself to, to cast them on. <laughs> that's terrible. But yes, I did finally get them done. So that's that. Uh, next finished object. Well, this next finished object is much more the kind of weight of yarn that I enjoy. And you might recognise one of the colours that I've used for these, because these are the Matryoshka mittens. And I used Brandy Super Soft, of which I have leftovers from my shallography and a cone. And I used the cone to make my fairy bouquet by Joanna Ang, which I talked about in the previous episode. I still have lots and lots of it left. I think when I weighed it, I had 450 grams still left on the cone, which considering it was a 500 gram cone, I don't quite know how I've managed to do that, but I still have a lot of yarn left on the cone. Anyway, these were actually made with the leftovers of the shawlography because if you've knitted the shawlography, you'll know that you actually end up with quite a lot of leftovers from your five skeins. Uh, I knitted mine in Holst Super Soft and the, the pattern required two balls of each, um, of each color that you were going to use. So that was 10 balls altogether. And each ball of Super Soft is 287 meters. And for, for I think three of, three or four of, I think it was actually four of the colors, I didn't break into the second ball. So I do have quite a lot of leftovers from that particular project. So I used up some in this. My other color, my contrast color here is uh, John Arbon's Exmoor Sock in the colorway Mizzle. And it's actually like a kind of silvery gray shade, you'll see. Now you knit these mittens entirely in red and white, red and, well, red in your contrast colour. So you'll see here, that's, that's essentially what you're knitting it in. So you're only doing um, colour work with two colours. And then once you've completed them, you then go and start doing your embroidery over the top. You can tell I am not an embroiderer. <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination, but this was really fun to do. Look at her little face. Isn't she lovely? <laughs> She's very cute. So I looked out some leftovers that I had and um, this black yarn here is actually for my son's jumper that I'm going to be talking to you about in a little bit. But, um, but yes, this is more shawlography leftovers here. This pink is a leftover from the cinnabar that I knitted for my gran uh, last year, and I'll talk a bit more about that later too. This green is from my Andrea Mowry striped sweater, and this gold is from my Andrea Mowry pink velvet sweater. So there we go. Isn't she cute? And even, you even do a little bit of embroidery on the, <laughs> on the thumb. <laughs> and basically most of the embroidery is just you're going over the, the stitches. I think we call that Swiss darning. So we're just kind of going over the stitches themselves. The only part that isn't done that way is the flowers. And it took me a few goes to figure out exactly what I was doing with that, but I, but I worked it out eventually and, um, and added these. I did for me these little gold flowers and really I mean you can you can let your imagination run wild in your creativity and you can you can do whatever embroidery you would like in whatever colors but um, I pretty much followed followed what it said in the pattern because I love the pattern so much this is actually my first pair of full mittens that I've ever knitted <laughs> which seems bizarre, but I have knitted fingerless mittens and I have knitted uh, gloves with fingers, uh, but I have never knitted <laughs> these, these kinds of mittens before. I'm really pleased with them, but you might notice, this is one, this is one of those mistakes. <laughs> you might notice that I have one is bigger than the other. So this one is bigger than this one. 
Now, not massively so, like not not really awful, but um, but certainly discernible for me, and I think also discernible in the fit. So I will just try them on to show you, and then I will explain to you what I did. So there's lots of learnings, I think, when we in our in our knitting, isn't there? <laughs> we're we're always uh, discovering new things. Sometimes not always in the in the best ways, but. But there we go. This actually fits a little bit better than this one here. Oh, we're getting, we're beginning to get the sunlight here. So look, <laughs> we have to move over just shortly. But this is um, this is a little bit bigger than this one. And I thought it was because I knitted this one on DPNs and then I put it down and then I knitted on the socks and I knitted them on Magic Loop. So when I picked up this, I decided I was going to knit it on Magic Loop. So I thought it was because I had knitted this on DPNs and this as Magic Loop. However, it was only when I was investigating a little bit further, I realised that I knitted this on an entirely different size of needle. <laughs> so I think I knitted this one on a 275mm and this on a 3. So again, like not massively different, so it's it's not it's not a problem. Um it's just a little bit looser around, it's just a little bit of a looser fit really but um but yes not not an issue and in fact you're supposed to have one russian doll a little bit bigger than the other otherwise they don't fit inside each other <laughs> so in that sense it's accurate there's the thumbs <laughs> so i think they're really they're really cute i will also point out that um i'm pointing out all my mistakes thank you very much mr bubo <laughs> but um on the first uh mitten for some reason, when I got to the thumb hole, I cast off the stitches for the thumb hole and then I cast on the stitches using backward loop method. And with the second one, I put the stitches on hold and then I um, created my stitches with the backwards loop method. So this is how it looks with the cast off and the backward loop. And this is how it looks when I put them on hold and the backwards cast on. So this one is much, much better, you'll see. You can really see that line going across there. And again, I mean, these are just, I'm being really nitpicky. <laughs> these are, you know, very small errors, um, but I like to kind of go back over something. Not with a, not with a, you know, an idea to, not with an approach that would be highly critical or um, castigating myself for, for, me, for making mistakes, just so that I can learn from them, so that I can choose to do something differently next time and, you know, really pay attention to, um, you know, improving my, my knitting practice. So, so there you go. That's the, I didn't say who these were by. These are the Deer and Matroshka mittens. They're on Ravelry. They're designed by somebody called Eleanor Mortensen, a designer called Eleanor Mortensen. She brought out the Deer mittens originally, I think, and then the Matroshka mittens came out as an additional chart. So they are actually listed as the Deer and Matroshka mittens. And you follow the instructions for the Deer mittens, but you use the Matroshka uh, chart. Uh, so it was good fun. I really enjoyed it. I would make more. <laughs> They're very cute. Now, now that I've made one pair of mittens and made mistakes, I would certainly knit more. So there we go. That's another finished object. Next finished object. It's another garment. <laughs> now, last Sunday, oh, last Saturday, actually, I decided that I was going to cast on what I thought would be a very quick knit. Something quick, something fun, something funky. So I cast on uh, Kingston by Goodnight Day Knits, who I think is Tara Lynn Morrison over on Ravelry. And I picked up this most amazing yarn from a friend from Knit Night on a day stash. And let me see, do I have the... Ah, uh, there it is. There's, this is the, it was from Chile. It's Chilean yarn. 
and I'm not really sure what the what the content is. It doesn't. Oh, it's um, yeah, it's 100% lamb's wool, I think. Uh, it is so soft and lovely. It's it's very bouncy. It is a single ply. In fact, I'll show you. This is what I had left of five balls. So you can see kind of what it's like. And I was holding two held together. And I was knitting it on 15 millimeter needles. So like I said, this is a quick knit. And this is what I ended up with. I'm going to have to move, I can tell. Okay, well, let's do that just now. Move all of this over here and shuffle along. <laughs> and then I might have to shuffle back again, but, <laughs> but I can see the sun is creeping, creeping, creeping. So here we go. We'll just move you over like that. Okay. <laughs> so here we are. This is the Kingston sweater. It's super cropped. The sleeves are three quarter length. And like I said, that is the amount of yarn I had left. So not very much yarn left at all. I made some modifications. I did five rows of, uh, of the net for the neckband in twisted rib. And I did extra rows at the bottom in twisted rib as well. And for the sleeves, I knitted them to about 11 inches, I think. And then I did two, knitted two together the whole way around and then cast off with a eye cord, which just really kind of brought it in and created a bit of a puff. So I'll actually, I'll pop it on so you can see. Now, like I said, I, casted this, I cast this on on Saturday and I knew that I wanted to do some modifications to it. I have knitted one of these before. In fact, I've knitted two of these before. You might remember that I accidentally shrunk one, uh, which was annoying, <laughs> and then had to knit another. But um, but here we go. The um, I had decided I was going to do some modifications, and some of the modifications that I decided I was going to do were um, short rows. So I created short rows. I've not actually blocked this yet, but here you go. You'll get a, you'll get a sense of, of what it looks like. There you go. So like I said, it's quite short. It could lie a little bit better, I think. I used a larger needle for the, for the hem so that it lay a bit flatter. But there we go. Um, <laughs> it's very cute. I really like it. Somebody said it was the perfect colour for Valentine's Day, and it is... So yes, I added in short rows and, you know, I'll just show you what I did on the front. I, if you can imagine, this is the back, yeah? I created short rows in the back and I did them from here to here and then here to here and then here to here. But what that did was it created, a, and it, I mean, if I thought about this, this makes sense. It would have created a larger, you know, bit of fabric that kind of you know, bumped out here, but at the back. Um, so I only noticed that when I split for the sleeves and I held it up and I realised I had this kind of misshapen bit at the back and I thought, oh, well, that's, <laughs> that wasn't the look I was going for. <laughs> so I ripped it all back out and I just knitted it to pattern. Um, but remember this short row uh, mistake when it came to raglan increases when I come to talk about my whips because I had another very similar issue, so I'm obviously going through a, a learning uh, opportunity as it comes to uh, raglan back back shaping on raglan garments. <laughs> so, so anyway, not like a huge amount to say about this other than I really like it. I wasn't sure if I was going to like the sleeves, but I do. I really love love how they're a little bit puffed. Um, I love the that they're brought in with this tighter eye cord. And actually for doing things like knitting when um, my needles don't get stuck in my sleeves or for doing the dishes or for preparing the dinner or those kinds of things. It actually, I really quite like this length of sleeve because it allows me um, freedom to, to do what I need to do. So there we go. That's the Kingston by Tyrolyn Morrison. 
in the yarn that I picked up on a D stash, um, Chilean 100% wool, hill double, I think it was probably Aran wheat, um, possibly bulky, um, held double and knitted up on size 15 needles. I think I did size 15 millimeter needles for the body, nine millimeters for the uh, for the neckband and 12 millimeters for the for the hem. So there we go. That's the Kingston. And that is all my finished objects. It's a lot, hey. So I'm going to add in a wee section here at this point because I want to show you another jumper and this is a jumper that you will be really familiar with because I've shown you it lots of times before but this is the Astrid by Junko Okamoto. It is a beautiful jumper, I love it so much. I had already done quite a major alteration on the sleeves because um, the original pattern has you cast off pretty much there, uh, which creates a very large sleeve, uh, a large open sleeve. And I found that it was catching on everything. So I ripped it back and modified it to create this longer cuff and put some improvised, some decreases around here, um, just to kind of bring it in a bit and, and to lengthen it. And that made that a lot more wearable. However, the hem was a rolled hem and the rolled hem created uh, the gar the influenced the, the shape of the garment into uh, kind of like an A shape. Yeah, so if you can imagine a rolled hem kicks the whole garment out at the edges and it pulls the, the fabric to create this kind of um, triangle shape. And as much as I love the garment itself and the fabric and I love the sleeves, I found I did not love the shape. It, it didn't sit properly on me. Um, she does use, I think, uh, I think she used mocha yarn, which was a Romanian single ply merino in a sport weight base, which I don't think is being produced anymore. Um, but it was, you know, it's a woolly wool. So it wouldn't have had a lot of drape to it. Um, and so it would have been a, like a similar to this because this is knitted in Jameson and Smith uh, four ply. And this is uh, with some Rauma and some Garthenor Priscelli and this lovely dark blue is whole super soft. So these are all woolly wools. So, you know, like I was saying before about if you were to do a stick or something, not that I would on this, but <laughs> Um, if you were to do a stick on this, it would be fine because the, the wool would stick to itself. But um, but yes, it, it created this shape which didn't look didn't look good. I didn't feel like, like it looked good on me. I didn't enjoy wearing it as much. I take off this big jumper. So it was my intention for quite a long time, really. Make sure I put this on the right way. It was my intention for quite a long time to rip back that rolled hem and to knit uh, a straightforward rib on the hem um, to make it a different shape, make it a little bit more wearable. So that is what I have done. And it really has made a huge difference. See, look at these. Aren't they fab? I love these sleeves. I think they're great. They're real statement sleeves. So standing up, you'll see now that the garment hangs completely differently than it did before. When it was a rolled hem, yeah, you can imagine it, it would, the whole thing was kicking out and away from the body. But now that it's this um, rib, it is sitting, it's lying much better. And actually it's got much better drape to it. And it doesn't cinch in at the, at the hips, but it's just lying flatter, which, um, which I think is just creating a much straighter shape rather than this a triangle shape that that it was creating before. So there we go. You can see we're beginning to get the sunlight again. So I'm going to shift us a little bit further over. <laughs> Running away from the sun, which seems like a travesty in the in the winter time in in Scotland, but there we go. So 
this was, I, and I did this, like I said, I, I've been putting this off for such a long time, but I decided that I was finally going to make the effort and actually do it. And I have quite a few things, few garments that are not being worn because they need, to, need something doing to them. They need some kind of alteration, they need a moderation, they need a mend. And so I thought I'm going to add in this section into the podcast um, called Mending uh, to make a point of trying each, before each episode, to have altered or mended another garment so to make it wearable and to add it back into rotation in my wardrobe. So this was the first one of those. I have, I, like I said, I've got quite a few to, to tend to and you might have a few to tend to as well. So if you would like to do this along with me, you're more than welcome to do it. I'm not running a, like an official like mend along or anything like that. It's really just an opportunity to, to really make a point of pulling things out of our wardrobe that we're just not wearing because, because there's you know something wrong with them. You know, maybe the, the sleeves need lengthened. Uh, maybe the hem needs, needs an adjustment. Uh, or maybe it's got a hole in it and it just needs a little bit of attention and uh, it needs to be darned. Um, whatever reason it is, then maybe it's time just to pull that out and, and to give it a bit of a fix. And uh, and yeah, so I'm going to be I'm going to be doing a bit more of that over the over the coming months of 2022. OK, so gosh, we're at 50 minutes and I've just run through the finished objects and what I mended. I do have some whips <laughs> to share with you also. So I'm going to pop this down here gosh, and show you what I cast on. So the first thing that I cast on was this. Now, as I mentioned about these little mittens, this pink here was from my Cinnabar, on her cheeks as well, <laughs> was from my Cinnabar shawl, which is another design by Andrea Mowry. And I knitted this last year for my gran and, uh, and gave it to her. But I decided in January that actually what I really wanted was some brioche knitting. And I found brioche knitting very meditative. Uh, I find it really joyful as well. Um, it creates a lovely sort of bouncy, squishy fabric, which is just, it's so, um, it's got so much volume to it, so much body to it. It's very warming to wear, but it's, I find it a real joy to knit. So this is what I have so far. So it's, it's not that far along, but we're, we're, we've made a start. <laughs> And I am using a Zauber ball, a crazy Zauber ball. Where is it? There it is. So this is by Schopel and it's the Zauber ball. And this is in the color orangery. So it's all of these beautiful sort of pinks and corals and purples. There's a little bit of gold, a little bit of white, pinks. It's just, I'm really, really enjoying this. Look at that. So, uh, like with knitting the Spark cardigan, uh, there's a real joy in knitting this because you're, you're really being present with the colours as they're unfurling through the fabric. And, uh, and that's certainly the case here because look at all of this. Isn't it absolutely beautiful? I love it. Love it, love it. With the Cinnabar shawl, you have kind of two thirds of it end up brioche and one third of it ends up this, which is, I'm not even sure what we would call this stitch actually. Basically, you are knitting the same row twice. So when you get to the end of one row, you're pushing your stitches all the way back to the beginning, as you would with brioche, and you're knitting that, you're knitting back across um, and then with the second colour and um, and this stitch here is much more kind of like a, I suppose like a garter stitch that's been knitted twice on each row with a different colour of yarn. 
and it kind of creates this effect. So this is your increase. It's going to end up kind of like a large triangle shawl, but with a with a offset point. And I'm using my secondary color is Drops Charisma in this lovely kind of dark plummy aubergine shade. Now you might notice that uh, these are quite drastically different weights. This is four ply and this is a heavy DK, I would say. And the result of that, I, well, I really love because then we've got this very sort of puffy uh, DK weight yarn. And then we've got this really delicate transitional color coming through. And on this side, we've got this um, fine yarn moving through all the colors and it's being supported by this kind of the, the, the darker, um, heavier weight yarn. You're also using the heavier weight yarn to create your, your garter edge. And this is the only modification that I've made to this pattern, which is that I slip the last stitch to create a smooth, slip the last stitch with your yarn held forward to create a smooth edge. And I do that on all my shawls, just because I think it shows a much better it's a much better finish i'm losing my battle with the sun <laughs> hurry up amy <laughs> so i'm really excited about this because just because it's so much fun um i think it feels like a uh, doesn't um hoki have a shawl called party on my needles uh this feels like a party on my needles even though it's a different pattern <laughs> it feels joyful it feels fun i enjoy going through the different colours and yet it has the repetition of it and um, doesn't require like a massive amount of attention. So when I do look down I'm delighted and I can also just sit and have a blether in at night or or sit and watch the television and, and work on some rules of this. So I'm going to keep going on that. It's not going to be a super fast project and um, so it's kind of like a Kind of like a background project. Do you do that? Like a background project and something which is a bit more, which is um, requiring a little bit more attention from you and uh, which you're working on a bit more solidly um, because I have one of those too. And I'm going to share that with you now. For Christmas, I gave my children vouchers, um, which said that I would create a knitted garment with them. Uh, so rather than producing a, a gift knit at Christmas, I really wanted them to be involved in the creative process. I wanted to be able to get accurate measurements of everybody. <laughs> and I wanted it to be knitted up in colours or weights or designs that they would genuinely love to wear. So I had conversations with all three of them and the, um, and the, the kids chose three beautiful designs and I have cast one of them on. The first one I've cast on is in the lightest colour that was chosen, which is, I'll show you here, these colours here. Oh, where's the other one? Am I sitting on it? No, it's fallen off the futon. There we go. These ones here, I ordered from Holst because um, I find Holst very reasonable. Um, when you are knitting three large gift knit jumpers for people, um, then I think whole, you know buying all your yarn at the same time, it can be expensive. And so I chose to go with Holst because I believe that it's a very good yarn. It creates a really lovely fabric, and uh, and I knew that it had a, a wide range of colours that the kids could choose from as well. So, um, so this is the colour that my middle child, my eldest son, chose. So this is for Seb. If you've watched this um, podcast for a while, you will might remember Seb from when I had to knit kilt hose a couple of years ago because he got his kilt for his 21st birthday and I knitted a pair of kilt hose to go with it. So um, I also knitted him the, uh, what's it called, the Jones cardigan that I had converted to a jumper, so the heavyweight Aran green cabled jumper. So anyway, he's chosen this colour. Uh, I had interpreted it as light grey, but actually when it's arrived, it is a lovely grey-green shade. 
and he wanted a lightweight jumper but he really liked the single malt sweater by Maxim Sear. So I am knitting the single malt which is designed as an iron weight jumper but I'm knitting it in sport weight I would say. I would say that's what I get when I hold these two together. And so I'm having to make modifications. So I knitted up my swatch, which I will show you here, and I washed and blocked it. And I was really pleased with the, with the fabric that I got here. I thought it looked really lovely. I've knitted it in the round, which is why you see these bits here. When I knit in the round for a swatch, I knit my row and then I just hold my yarn loosely and I push my stitches back to the beginning of the row. Um, so then I've got like a long piece of yarn held over the back and then I knit the next row. So I'm just knitting, knitting, knitting. I'm not going back and forth. I'm going over the same row again and again, like you do when you are knitting in the round. And that makes sure that you get the the gauge swatch which is going to be appropriate for a jumper that has been knitted in the round uh, because obviously when we're knitting back and forth our tension might be different. So if you're knitting back and forth then knit your swatch back and forth. If you're knitting in the round knit your swatch in the round. So that's what it looks like. The Oh dear. Oh no. <laughs> the, <laughs> I'm getting, um, I'm losing my battle here I think. Um, the super soft really bloomed really beautifully, puffed right up and I was really pleased with that and so it's created a, a much um, more co coherent and consistent fabric than I was wondering if it would particularly when I first finished the swatch. So having knitted my swatch I've then measured to see how many stitches I have going across per inch, well per four inches and then I divided that by four so make sure that I had um, how, many how many stitches per inch. And then I looked at my pattern and I looked to see uh, how many inches I needed for Seb, which was 44. So I want a 44 inch chest. So I multiplied 44 by the number of stitches that I was getting per inch. And that took me to, I think it was 220. And so then I looked at my pattern and I looked to see which size would give me 220 stitches after the sleeves had been, after the split for the sleeves. So the body stitches, 220, and that was size seven. So I'm effectively knitting a size seven in order to get a size four. There may be other modifications that I need to do as I go along in order to make sure that uh, that I get a consistent size for, for Seb. I will be following any kind of measurement instructions uh, for size four and I'll be knitting any specific stitch numbers from size seven, if that makes sense. So that's how, I, that's how I'm gonna modify. It's probably a pretty rudimentary uh, way of, of modifying and there's probably much more sophisticated ways to go about it than that, but uh, that ostensibly works for me and then if I come across issues as and when I'm knitting then I'll then I'll fix them as I go. Speaking of issues and fixing as we go, <laughs> I have actually cast it on. I've actually cast it on three times. <laughs> so uh, this is the second time I cast it on. So the first time I cast it on I used size 3.75 millimeter needles um, and the neckline, you're only casting on 81 stitches and it just felt really, really tight. So I knitted the neck band and then tried it on over my own head and went, oh, it's just, it just feels too tight. So I went up to, I ripped that back and I went up to a four millimeter needle and uh, did the cast on that I'm doing is a German twisted cast on, which is a stretchy cast on. So um, to make sure that it would go over my head, over Seb's head. I think he has a bigger head than me. So if it, if it goes over my head, but not very comfortably, then um, there's, a, there's an issue there. And that was unfortunately the case with this one as well. I could get it on, but it felt like it was, it felt like it was a bit too tight. Um, however, I could have, you know, possibly 
figured out something to do with that and just kept going. But uh, I messed up. I then realised that I had messed up my short rows. And you'll see the short row shaping here has gone horribly wrong. And I realised afterwards what I did, and I'm not going to give away too much of the pattern, but you are working your short rows within the ribbed neckline, within the ribbed neckband. And it asks you to knit so many stitches uh, after the marker, and then so many, and then to knit back to the marker, and then knit so many stitches. I knitted that number of stitches from the the wrap in, from the double from the German short row. So rather than knitting it back to the marker and then knitting the number of stitches, I was told, which would have taken me to here, I ended up stopping far too early, and so that meant that I've kind of created sort of shaping, which is larger over one shoulder rather than centered going across the back. Now, it's not super obvious. It's obvious now that I've pointed out, I'm sure, because I cannot, I can't, I can't not see it. <laughs> is the honest truth. <laughs> but, um, but yes, uh, I, I've thought, well, the neck band's already a little bit tight. I'm not happy with um, the the error that I've made. If I'm going to rip it, if I'm going to stop, um, now's the time to do it. I've only done, well, I cast it on the day before yesterday and did most of that yesterday and I finished, sort of stopped about mid-afternoon and went, not right. So rather than ripping it back, I decided to keep it, to, to show it and uh, show my mistakes, <laughs> keeping with a the theme and cast on again. So I've cast on again. So having now cast on three times, <laughs> I've made uh, changes. <laughs> I have a much looser, wider neck band because I cast, I did a, a German twisted cast on again, but I did that using 4.5 millimeter needles. I then knitted the first row with 4.5 millimetre needles before dropping down to a four for the rest of the neck band. I have much more successfully done my, my short row, my short row shaping, having not made the same error as before, so that's uh, significantly better. <laughs> And uh, the other thing that I decided to change was in the original pattern, which I've done on this one, your first row is a row of purl stitches. I'm gonna have to turn that over because I can't abide, I can't look at the short, the short row shaping mistake anymore. Um, you'll see that this first row here is a row, is a purl row. So it creates a really kind of discernible, um, ridge between the neck band and the beginning of the the textured pattern. In this one I decided I didn't like that and so what I've done instead is I've started with a knit row and that's created a much smoother transition from the neck band into the into the textured fabric. It's a beautiful pattern it's got these really lovely um, detail for the raglan increases which I think works really well that ties into the the neck band so it's very smooth in much the same way as Joanna Ang's uh, fairy bouquet you know there's a real attention to the detail of the design and there are design elements built in that will really delight you know an experienced or even non-experienced knitter I love how these two yarns are knitting up together because I think the lighter Titicaca, um, which is the, the it was, this is in the colour eucalyptus and this is in the colour pebble. I don't think I said that. This is the whole super soft holst um, Titicaca, the, um, which is 100% lace weight alpaca. So the alpaca here is really highlighting the, the stitch definition in the texture, textured fabric. So I'm not very far along, as you can see, I would have been further along if I hadn't kept ripping out, but there we go. Uh, <laughs> I'm much more confident now that what I have is something which will not only fit over his head, 
but it uh, will sit on his body better because of the, the short row shaping has been adjusted now and uh, and that I'm free to free to continue on with that. I will keep this in my in my project bag to um, make sure that if I do need more yarn, um, if I run out of the balls of yarn, that I can unravel this and knit it. But I don't think I will. I think I've got I think I've got plenty. So those are my works in progress. I'm going to stop just there and uh, and adjust myself to try and find a place to continue where I have better light. Okay. <laughs> Hi, back again. <laughs> the sun has shifted slightly over towards the left, so I've come over to the right. It will continue moving to the left, so this will <laughs> this situation will resolve itself over time and patience uh, is needed. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I stopped, I had some snacks, and I made myself another cup of tea. And uh, now I'm going to tell you about what I'm going to be casting on next. So you may have seen that yesterday, this would be Thursday, the um, wonderful podcaster Rebecca of the Crea Bea podcast announced that she was doing a collaboration with the company Woolly Knit and they were doing a, a conalong, uh, C-O-N-E-A-L-O-N-G, a cone along. And the, it's basically a knit along where you're invited to, to use cones. She has a discount code for Woolly Knit, which you should go and check out. And there are prizes to be won, of course. So you should go and check out her uh, podcast episode where she tells you all about it and also her Instagram channel and I'll pop links to that in the show notes. So I have been thinking about what I would like to participate in the cone along with. Now as I just mentioned I am knitting on this single malt sweater but it is not in cone yarn it is with cakes because I did try and buy a cone of this yarn, but they didn't have any cones left in stock, so I bought seven balls of yarn instead. However, for the other two children, and I'm calling them children, but my, my eldest is 23, uh, Seb, who my middle child, who's getting this one here, he is 22, and my youngest is 20. He'll be 21 later this year. So they're, they're all fully grown. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I have the yarn, I bought cone yarn for their jumpers. Now Aurora, my eldest, has asked for a peated whiskey uh, cardigan by Thea Coleman and she wanted it in this colour here, which is slate grey. Now for some reason this cone seems much fatter than my other cones. I don't really know why. I think maybe it feels softer as well, so I don't know whether it's, maybe it just doesn't have as much spinning oil in it, I don't know, because Holst Super Soft, which this is, uh, generally has a lot of uh, spinning oil in it. And this actually feels very light, soft and fluffy, so that might account for the, <laughs> for the slightly larger uh, cone because I will show you this cone as well This my son my youngest son Alexander he has chosen the Albion sweater by Michelle Wang which is a jumper design I think it's out by Brooklyn Tweed I could be wrong um, but it's kind of based on a, a Gansey style it's a modern update on a Gansey style jumper and he wanted it in black pitch black here we go, just to show you the difference between these two cones, which are both the same weight, but this one has been wound much, much more tightly. Do you see that? There we go. And this one um, feels much um, finer yarn, this feels much puffier, but this is what happens when you wash um, whole super soft, it blooms, so it becomes much more fluffy. I have stolen a little bit off this cone to do the hair on the uh, Matroshka Mittens dolls. <laughs> Just a little tiny bit. There'll still be plenty for his uh, for his jumper, I think. But both of those jumpers 
uh, I will, with the cardigan and the jumper, I will be holding Holst double. So, um, so yes, I'll be doing that. Oh, I meant to show you something else that I bought. Hang on a second. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> Not strictly yarn related. I bought this and I got, I had a little sort of leather tie that went through, I don't really know why. Um, I bought this from Flying Tiger, which is a shop, I think it's originally from Copenhagen. Uh, we have one in Waverley Centre, Waverley Market in Edinburgh, they are all over the place I think. And uh, they sell very inexpensive things, a whole range of houseware, there's some craft stuff, there's candles, there's some toys, there's some stationery, they just all kinds of things. So I found this and it was labelled as a paper towel dispenser. However, for me, <laughs> it will be a cone dispenser. Ah! <laughs> I think this cost me eight pounds, so not very expensive. And uh, my plan is, now I've wound this on too tightly, my plan is to use my yarn and I'm going to wind off some of this yarn from the cone into cakes so that I can hold it double. So because of that you'll see that when I'm pulling it, it's going to spin round. So it's going to make it much easier to cake up my yarn. So I wanted to share that with you in case you are knitting from cones and you are struggling somewhat to, to wind off some of your, your yarn. It's fine if you're going to knit um, with just one single strand, then you don't really have to do anything to it. But if you're going to knit double strands, then you're going to want to take some of the yarn off the cone in order to be able to do that. And I think this little wooden gadget will do me well. But really, if you have already a paper towel dispenser, then that will probably suffice for you to be able to, to use a bit. If you are in the market for one specifically for your cones, your yarn cones, then um, then I can recommend uh, that uh, Flying Tiger has these in at the moment. And I quite like it because it actually has the bottom of it shaped. I don't know if you see that. So it really actually holds the cone pretty well. So there we go. I'm going to be knitting the Albion for Xander in the black Holst Super Soft held double and I'm knitting Petey Twisky for Aurora in uh, Holst Super Soft Slate Grey held double. So I'll be casting those on. I'm not sure how long this is going to take me because like I said I am knitting a size 7 to get a size 4 so it's um, it's not a small, it's not a small amount of knitting, but I'm hoping that it will knit up relatively quickly and I'll be able to crack on with the other kids' jumpers. Although I really don't want to cast on the black one until, can you imagine, I have more daylight. <laughs> I'm complaining about having too much and then not enough, but really I, I need a few more hours of daylight, I think, in the day in order to, before I cast on the, before I cast on the Albion in the black. But I also have another cone for myself that I think I am definitely going to cast on for the cone along. Uh, I'm going to cast on the Foxberry sweater for myself and that's a pattern by Sari Nordland. And I have this beautiful skein of Scarab. Again, this is whole super soft, but it's kind of like an antique gold color. It's not really showing, that's probably truer to to colour. And I have some of this, which again is Holst, Holst Titicaca. This is in the colour bronze. And I'm going to hold the two of those together for this gold foxberry sweater. So I'm really excited about that. In fact, I desperately just want to cast that on, but I have, uh, I have some other knitting to do before I get to that point. Certainly want to get this off the needles first. Uh, before I before I cast this on, but I might I might just do myself a swatch just to to tide over my desire my cast on desires. And <laughs> um, I also at the same time as buying um, the cones for the children, 
I picked up some more Holst um, Titicaca for myself and this is in the colour Blossom and it's this beautiful shade of kind of like a dark pink I suppose, almost bordering on purple but I bought it specifically for this cone here and this is this ridiculous sized mystery cone from the charity shop which weighs an absolute ton. I think it is now, did we say it's 1.7? I think it is now what, down to 1.7 kilos and that's after I've knitted a jumper with it already. So it's, it's a lot of a lot of yarn but it is quite, it's, it's fine once you wash it because again it's got spinning oil in it and you can smell that but um, and it blocks and it said on, it said that it was on the label that it was Shetland yarn. It's got lovely sort of bluish heathered flecks through it. It's my hair it gets everywhere. <laughs> uh, so it's a lovely yarn, but it's not as soft as, uh, certainly not as soft as Holst Super Soft. Of course, Holst Super Soft is actually a combination of Shetland and Merino, whereas I think this might just be Shetland. And Shetland is lovely and soft in and of itself, but I thought held with this Holst Titicaca, I think it will soften it up even more and it will be a really lovely combination. So I don't have a project for these yet, so I'm just going to put this to one side and uh, with the intention of knitting it at some point with this. Uh, this will be going into a lot of projects, I would imagine, because there is just so much of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I, we're actually into the um, the bought section of the of the podcast. So what I've actually bought over the last wee while? Well, I bought those cones for the kids' jumpers. I bought the blossom titicaca for myself. Um, I also popped into one of my local yarn shops, Be Inspired Fibers, over in Marchmont. It's a really lovely. Uh, yarn shop, I really enjoy going there. May has such a wonderful selection of yarns, lots of hand dyed, but more recently um, really branching out and, and getting more uh, yarn like Lopi and uh, Jameson and Smith. So I've been, I, I, I always love going there, I always love to, to go for a browse, but um, I went the other day there because she had posted up on her Instagram that she had had a shoplifter in and I, you know it's such a terrible thing for a small business to to have that um, kind of impact on your on your business but also you know on your sense of people's goodness and so I really wanted to pop in and offer some love and some support and I picked up a couple of skeins of yarn while I was there and so not that I need an excuse to go, but that, that's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> I bought some Olan and these are Merino Singles in the colour Amber. Aren't they beautiful? It's kind of like a, a burnt caramel shade, I think. And my intention for these, because I always buy yarn with intentions, apart from that blossom. <laughs> Contradicting. That's the, that's the exception that breaks the rule, or proves the rule. That's the phrase. <laughs> My intention for these is to do the Pressed Flowers Shawl by Amy Christoffers. Um, I really love that shawl. It's supposed to be knitted in a DK, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to adapt the pattern and knit it for in a um, four-ply instead, pairing it up with my beautiful Suri from Blue Dot Yarns that I got at Perth Yarn Festival uh, last year. So... I think they go really, really well together. This is going to be the flowers. We're going to have some fluffy flowers and then this beautiful silky um, merino singles. I think that's going to be a beautiful shawl. So I'm really excited about that. I was also, I also bought some of this yarn. I uh, oh, can't resist a sale, it's a problem. <laughs> I was sent an email from John Arban and they were saying that they were going to be discontinuing some of their alpaca 2-3 ply and uh, there was a link to go and check the colours out <laughs> and, I, and so I bought some and uh, the alpaca 2-3 ply is 90% alpaca, 10% nylon and there are 600 metres per 100 grams which seemed like exceptionally good um, meterage. 
so it is I suppose like a heavy lace or a light fingering weight um, I bought three skeins in this colour Clementine just this wonderful bright joyful orange and I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to knit with it but I, th I think that I want to knit a design from Lily Kate France that came out last year I can't remember what the design is called now she knitted a beautiful version in red and I think this would be a really lovely yarn for it. I think it would be, it would give a beautiful drape. So I'll pop the, I'll pop the name of the design that I'm thinking of here. But, uh, but yes, I bought three skeins of Clementine in the alpaca to three ply from John Arbin. Uh, you can't go wrong with John Arbin yarns. It's just consistently um, beautiful stuff. And then I've been gifted a couple of skeins. So I received this beautiful skein, which was a gift from my friend Raya, and she brought it back for me from her trip to Iceland, and it is naturally dyed. And again, it's, it's a single ply. It feels a little bit rustic. It's first class lamb's wool, one ply fingering, and it's 500 grams, 220 meters. And it's just, I love this colour. Mm, it's just so lovely. It's beautiful. So I'm really excited about exploring what to do with this and adding it into something um, something else, like maybe with some colour work or something would be beautiful. And I was also gifted this. Uh, my son's girlfriend parents were over from Germany uh, last weekend and we met up with them and Sabina is a wonderful knitter and so we went to Ginger Twist Studio and she gifted me this beautiful skein here. It is Massa Mayhem which is uh, Jess from Ginger Twists. It's her Massam BFL base which is my favourite that she does and it's um, four ply and this colour is called, can you see this? Brighter Than Barbie. Oh yeah! <laughs> Isn't it fab? What I love about the mass and base actually is that you can see it's got this kind of darker undertone. So you've got these kind of like dark fibers running through it, but it's just beautiful. I have a couple of skeins of Massam BFL blend, which are undyed. So I've got two of these. They're different brands, but they are the same because um, because they're just undyed. So I'm thinking about pairing these together. I did see a beautiful shawl by Nancy Marchand, which I think is called the Whorl, which is really lovely and would make a real feature of this beautiful pink in the brioche border, which I think could be really interesting. Um, or alternatively, I could do a colour work jumper if it was cropped uh, possibly because this is 1200 meters that I have here um, so yes there are there are possibilities so I'm really excited about you know pairing this very very bright shade with the natural shades I think it, it not doesn't tone it down as such I think it makes it more wearable and I think it creates a real pop so I'm excited about that and that was a really, really lovely gift. So, so yes, that's my, those are my yarn and other acquisitions, including my paper towel dispenser. <laughs> so on to what brings me joy. So we're coming towards the end of things. It's been a, it's been a long podcast <laughs> with a break in the middle, but, um, <laughs> but what's been bringing me joy? Well, I recently finished watching the new series of Queer Eye on Netflix and that's a show that I really enjoy. I think it is um, full of warmth and love and care and I think there's a genuine desire um, that, uh, you know, to bring harmony and connection and uh, a really sort of deep-seated sense of of self in the world and uh, and I really appreciate that and so I really enjoy it and it's full of love and full of 
you know, laughter and tears. I don't think I get through an episode without crying, but <laughs> but uh, but yes, I really enjoy that. And so that was that was a real treat for me to to sit down and, and watch those episodes. I have now finished it, so I'll have to wait for the next series to come out whenever that's going to be. Uh, the other thing that I've been watching on TV has been The Green Planet, uh, which is the documentary series by David Attenborough over on the BBC, which focuses specifically on plants and plant life. David Attenborough did a series of documentaries a long time ago, which were called like The Secret Life of... And I think they had like the secret life of birds and the secret life of mammals. Uh, there was also the secret life of plants and that was always my favourite one. So when the Green Planet was announced I knew that I was going to love it and I absolutely did. I found it completely fascinating. Each episode and I think there was five of them, five episodes, maybe six, um, focused on something slightly different. So there was one that focused on the water, there was one that focused on the canopy, there was one that focused on seasons, there was one that focused on the desert, and there was one that focused on the way the relationship between people and plants. Um, it, every single episode was brilliant and at the end they do this, uh, which they do in all of these documentary series, at the very last 10, 15, 10 minutes or so I think it is, they show you how they filmed a particular part of the documentary um, developing new techniques for filming, new apparatus or new approaches or how they met particular environmental challenges or all of those kind of things and that's almost as fascinating as the documentary itself so so I really enjoyed that, I thought that was excellent too. Uh, on a slightly different note, another thing that's been, well, slightly different and slightly the same, <laughs> not watching on TV but definitely plant related I have been absolutely loving my window boxes. <laughs> I cannot remember whose recommendation it was to plant spring bulbs, but I planted some miniature irises and I think I've planted miniature tulips, but I can't remember. So that will be a surprise. But the miniature irises have already all come up. Like I said, we've had an incredibly mild winter and so the irises have already all bloomed and that's been completely delightful to see them you know burst into colour right outside my window so I'm excited to see the tulips which I think are already well the leaves are already maybe about two inches above the soil so I'm hoping that in the next couple of weeks we'll be getting some colour from them as well uh, so that's all very exciting <laughs> Another thing that's bringing me joy has been my knit night. Um, it's been such a delight for that to, to be restarted again after Christmas and um, we've been meeting up and knitting together and laughing together and being in each other's company and that's an incredible treat and one that, you know, after the last couple of years I really don't take for granted um, being able to enjoy each other's company and being able to connect with, with fellow knitters. And, uh, and through that actually being able to, to meet up in person with Rebecca of the Crea Bea podcast and Alex of the Ancestral Craft podcast, which is also a wonderful podcast. Both Alex and Rebecca live very close to me, so that's a, that's a real delight. So being able to, to meet up in person and to spend some time with one another has been a real delight over the last few weeks. Uh, talking about podcasts, I wanted to share three podcasts that I've been really, really enjoying. In fact, three podcasts that I have gone back to the beginning on and watched from episode one all the way up to most recent episodes. The first one is called Mel Makes Stuff. Mel is an incredibly experienced and expert knitter. She knits a wide variety of things. She is very comfortable with modifying her knits and she really talks you through why she's making particular choices and how she's creating the, the modifications in her work. And she's also a really wonderful colour work knitter. So it's been really interesting to see how she's been exploring that too. And um, particularly when she's been converting uh, pieced seamed uh, garments into into uh, steaked pieces as well so she does a range of 
videos which focus very particularly on projects, so one particular project, and uh, and so you get like a real sort of insight into her process and into the the real craft of creating a garment, and uh, and I really really appreciate that. Also, I would say if you are looking for a podcast that really focuses quite specifically on knitting, um, then hers is really, really excellent. And I think you'll enjoy going back like I did over previous episodes and watching those. The second one I want to share is the Black Spruce Knitting Podcast, which is Ali and she's based in Vermont. She is also a really wonderful knitter. She has got a beautiful tone of voice, very easy to listen to. <laughs> And, uh, and I really enjoy watching her projects as well. She's currently working on a test knit for Catherine Clark called the Wise Weeds um, Jumper Sweater. And, uh, and I, l I love watching the progress of that and, and seeing how that's developing. And, uh, and yeah, so I highly recommend her podcast as well. She recently did a trip to a mill, so you get to see a bit of footage from that as well and um, I, I think you'll just really enjoy her. And the last one is Casey from Young Folks Knits. Um, I, I love her too. She's based down in uh, Arkansas and she lives on a farm and she's a beekeeper. She's recently, I think it maybe it's still going on, there's a cowl that she's been doing for the Humble Bee Shawl um, which is a design by Lerka of Fibre Tales. And so she's been doing a, a cowl for this beautiful shawl and she always knits really lovely, lovely things. Again, I think that she knits quite different choices. So quite often when I'm seeing her choice of designs, they're things that I either haven't seen before or haven't considered. And, uh, and I just love what she does with them. Um, she also has a really lovely way about her. She's very easy to listen to. So there's three podcasts that I'm really enjoying. And I think one of the things that I'm surprised about actually is that um, they, they don't have more viewers than they do because all three of them are, are truly, truly excellent. And so it made me wonder, you know, I think the YouTube algorithm, uh, it works well in some regards and in others not so well. And I feel like how is it possible, you know, for these wonderful podcast to exist in the world and for them to be hidden because I do think they sometimes they get our podcasts get hidden on YouTube. So I wanted to ask you which podcasts are you really enjoying? Do you think are really excellent which um you think are being hidden or deserve more attention? And uh leave your leave your answer for me in the comments because I would love to explore some more. And I'm sure we would all love to create that kind of resource where we can you know, go through the list and find more podcasts to watch. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the podcast. I did say this was a long one. I suppose that's about when you leave it for four weeks and you have so much knitting to share. But I wanted to end with a quote uh, which kind of really resonates with this, um, with the card that we started off with, this, this fixer. <laughs> um, because this quote really speaks to the importance of continuing on with our work even when we might have made mistakes or when things need to get fixed or things haven't quite turned out the way that we wanted it to. But actually, that's a really important part of the creative process. This quote is by Martha Graham, who was a choreographer. And um, it's a quote that I used to have written out it by hand and stuck up in my next in my study next to my computer so that it would always remind me to keep to keep being creative to keep sharing my voice so there is a vitality a life force a quickening that is translated through you into action and because there is only one of you in all time this expression is unique and if you block it it will never exist through any other medium and will be lost the world will not have it. It is not your business to determine how good it is, nor how valuable it is, nor how it compares with other expressions. It is your business to keep it yours clearly and directly and to keep the channel open. You do not even have to believe in yourself or your work. You have to keep open and aware directly to the urges that motivate you. Keep the channel open. 
No artist is pleased. There is no satisfaction whatever at any time. There is only a queer divine dissatisfaction, a blessed unrest that keeps us marching and makes us more alive than others. So my loves, I wish you wonderful knitting, great creativity and good health. And I hope to see you again really soon. Okay.